In day-to-day life, there are a few people you come into contact that you would trust implicitly from the second you meet them. It's very rare to say that anyone you bump into in the street isn't first met with at least a few seconds of judgment and an assessment to make sure you're safe. But there are those in certain professions that we instantly trust due to their status in society, and those professions we equate to safety would number just a few. Those in positions of power who are meant to keep us and those we love safe, such as emergency services and perhaps teachers, and in some cases religious figureheads, are barely ever questioned. One profession on that list would be a doctor. After years of training and having to stick to a strict code of conduct, we very rarely think to question the very people who are there to help us when we're at our weakest and most vulnerable. But what if the person who was meant to be helping you get better had intentions that were the complete opposite and in charge of the medicines that were meant to heal instead gave you a prescription that would harm? Today on the Carb London, we take a trip back to the Victorian era and uncover the story of Dr. Thomas Neil Cream, the Lambeth Poisoner. Life as a Victorian was a dangerous occupation. There were so many things around which could maim or kill you on a daily basis. If you weren't in grave danger every day at your factory job where you could be viciously mangled by the machines you worked with, or being mowed down by horse-drawn carriages and omnibuses, you were in danger of suffering poisoning from your home. Wallpapers were dyed using arsenic, particularly the very popular Skeels Green, which bedecked many a fancy dining room, even that of Queen Victoria herself, who had the wallpaper removed after a visiting dignitary became ill from the emanating poisonous fumes. If you were poor and worked in a factory, or even worse, was part of a workhouse, then your wages would be very pitiful, and even worse, if you were a woman, you'd often work for free. So with very few other opportunities, a lot of women decided to turn themselves onto the street, working selling themselves and being their own bosses. The hours were better and they could also earn a wage, but the profession did come with plenty of risks. Women often worked alone, which gave them little to no protection from the men who were employing them, which meant if a man didn't want to pay for the transaction and chose violence instead, then there wasn't much they could do about that but knives were often hidden in bustles and undergarments to help provide a little protection. But that's not to mention the silent killers, which was the number of diseases which came along with the profession, and also unwanted pregnancies, which was also an occupational hazard. The women who worked on the street had it tough, but if you were a higher class cool girl with a better class of clientele, things were made slightly easier as you had access to a doctor. Doctors were a godsend as they could help with any ailments one could contract from such a job, and they also helped with providing certain substances which could alter the mind state. They also could assist with those occupational hazards, the unwanted pregnancies, even though those types of procedures were illegal. Women were not officially allowed to become doctors until the late 19th century, but some brave souls did sneak through. And even then, when women could care for women, women's health was a low priority for the medical profession, unless it was to do with children and childbirth. The Victorians were mildly obsessed with treating women for ailments that didn't exist, like hysteria, and equally, women were treated as strange creatures with uncontrollable emotions that would get the better of them, and as such, were often given lengthy and expensive treatments for conditions that simply didn't exist. Doctors once trained were really not very regulated, and individuals could set up their own practices and shops anywhere they wanted, and peddle their own miracle cures for all sorts of things. Many people put their implicit trust in these people, and for the most part, there may have been a bit of swindling going on, but they were trying to help. However, if a medical professional had nefarious intentions, 
and wanted to off a few of his patients, it really would be a very easy thing to do. Thomas Neil Cream was born in Glasgow on May 27th, 1850. His father, William, was a timber merchant, and his mother, after giving birth to Thomas, subsequently had a further seven children. When he was four years old, the family moved to Quebec in Canada after the timber firm William worked for set up several new businesses there. William was offered a position heading up the Quebec office of Gilmore and Co and diversified the standard lumber business into a successful shipbuilding company, training up the children as each one was old enough to do so. However, the eldest of the brood, Thomas, had different ideas. He had no interest at all in being a timber merchant, preferring instead to spend hours reading. Instead, he set his sights on becoming a doctor. After securing himself a position to begin his studies at McGill University, it wasn't long before Thomas got stuck into his studies, doing very well and exceeding his classmates often. He specialised in anaesthetics and graduated after four years. During college, Thomas was often found to be getting high off his own supply, as he was said to dabble in the very drugs he was using on his patients. Chloroform and other inhibiting substances were bandied around on campus, and despite him ever publicly admitting he was using these drugs, his professors would later recall Cream being quite the wild child of his year. Just as he was wrapping up college and after his graduation, a fire broke out in Thomas's lodgings, which charred some clothing and a few other personal belongings. Luckily, Thomas had recently insured the room and claimed £350 for his damaged property, which came in handy as this gave him time to work out what he would do next. During his last year at college, the now 26-year-old Thomas had been enjoying some extracurricular activities with Flora Brooks, a teenage girl who lived in a little town near Cream's University lodgings. When Flora became seriously ill after a botched termination performed by Thomas himself, she revealed the relationship she was having with the graduate doctor. The Brooks family literally carried out a shotgun wedding, forcing him down the aisle with a hunting rifle, and the two were obviously very happily married, because nothing says everlasting love like being dragged down the aisle against your will. Rather unsurprisingly, the next day after the wedding night, Flora opened her eyes expecting to see her new husband, but rather fortunately, all she saw was a letter on the pillow next to her. Thomas had done a runner. Fearing the Brooks family would very much be on his case, the doctor left Canada and headed to England, with his sights set on London. At that time, London was a hotbed of medical advancements. Between the capital of Scotland, Edinburgh, and the capital of Britain, London, the UK was an exciting place to be for a junior doctor. Thomas set his sights on ingratiating himself with such prestigious places, and managed to secure himself an apprenticeship at St Thomas's Hospital, whose noted alumni of Florence Nightingale, and many other notable physicians and nurses, was a real draw to cream. Here he underwent an intensive six months of study, with the aim of applying to the Royal College of Surgeons at the end. However, Thomas had found London incredibly distracting from his studies, often preferring to spend long nights entertaining women in the West End instead of paying attention to his books. Unsurprisingly, he failed the entrance exam and had to undertake a further six months of study at St Thomas's. Here he branched into obstetrics and instead chanced his arm in Edinburgh, applying to the Royal College of Physicians, who accepted him, and after a year, was awarded a midwifery licence so he could practice above board. In London and across the world during the latter part of the 19th century, women were subjected to a lot of quack medical treatments. Conditions such as hysteria, fatness, and any other condition diagnosed of them by a male physician were often treated with a combination of tablets, tinctures, or other potions, which more often than not contained various deadly or compromising substances such as laudanum, arsenic, and other uppers and downers such as morphine and amphetamines. Women, particularly those in the upper and middle class bracket, were quite often on substances which were highly addictive, 
and it was very common to have a private physician which would deal out these prescriptions for you. Or alternatively, you could just discuss your symptoms at a chemist and they would hand over whatever they thought you needed. This led to years of people taking medicines which were not necessarily good for them and perhaps carried worse symptoms than their alleged illness to begin with. Without the knowledge of what was good for them or not, people chugged down whatever they were given and got on with their lives. And as such, doctors were free to give out whatever they thought might clear up the particular ailment. When Thomas's wife Flora, who he was still legally married to, got in touch from Canada, presumably asking for money or, you know, perhaps to find out where the bloody hell he might be, he replied to her and included a parcel of medicines for her to take to help her calm down. Seemingly, Flora was still suffering the complications of the surgery Thomas had carried out on her some months previously, and to help, he sent some cure-alls to her all the way from Edinburgh. Being a dutiful wife, she took the tablets, and after consulting with a local doctor, who said she should stop taking the tablets immediately, she did start to get better, but it wasn't long until her condition deteriorated when she developed a chest infection, passing away a few months later after contracting tuberculosis. Thomas now having a medical certificate under his belt and with the heat from the Brooks family having died down, quite literally, he made his way back to Canada and set up shop there, opening his own small practice. Things were going well for a short while, but when the body of a young pregnant woman, Kate Gardner, a rumoured romantic partner of his, was found dead in an alleyway behind his practice, having been smothered with a chloroform-soaked rag. Cream was the prime suspect. When interrogated by the coroner, Cream admitted he had tried to help Ms Gardner and prescribed her suicide as treatment, as he couldn't perform the termination for her as it was illegal. Not that this had seemingly bothered him before. And the reason Kate was dead in the alleyway was because she had done this to herself. Despite there being physical evidence on her body, such as struggle marks and also a lack of chloroform anywhere on her person. Nevertheless, despite the evidence being as present as Christmas, the dilly-dallying of the authorities gave him enough time to flee Canada. Hopping the border and making his way to Chicago in the USA, Cream began going by Dr. Neil, and in the days before internet stalking, a simple name change was enough to erase his tracks. Setting up yet another back alley clinic, Thomas knowingly positioned himself in a prime location next to the, shall we say, late night entertainment district. Before long, he was practicing illegally again, providing occupational hazard terminations for women. The police in Chicago were a bit more on the ball than in his previous location, and it wasn't long before they were knocking on the door, asking to have a look around. However, Cream was clever. He didn't poop where he ate. He made house calls for the women in need, and also used an intermediary midwife, who took a cut of the money and helped in the process, but also kept quiet about the illegal operations. In providing these services, you would think that Thomas was doing this to assist these women, trying to help them out of a bind, but by all accounts, he enjoyed carrying out these horrific treatments and experimenting with tablets that would also help with the process, which often contained an obscene amount of poison. The mania was starting to creep into Thomas's psyche, and his drug use was continuing to worsen. Alongside the medicines he doled out, he was now regularly taking various different tinctures, a lot of which contained stimulants and opiates. This was apparently causing an effect on his performance with women, and this only exacerbated his misogyny. Now becoming careless with his care, Thomas began making slip-ups. One of his patients, Mary Ann Faulkner, who underwent a termination, died soon after it had been carried out. When Thomas was interrogated over the malpractice and illegal procedure, he blamed the midwife saying she had performed the procedure badly and then called on him for help to finish the job. Yet again, Cream managed to talk his way out of the situation and with a few bribes bandied around, he was not charged for any wrongdoing. 
Cream's homemade remedy struck again when he prescribed a series of tablets for a woman as birth control, which just so happened to be filled with yet another concoction of poisons. She took them over a period of days, but again, Thomas had been clever to not leave any identifying evidence of where these pills were obtained from, prescribing them without packaging and in an unmarked bottle. He also didn't make any record of Ellen Stack, the deceased woman, having visited him, so when the police tried to tie him to the death, there was nothing they could find to implicate him. Up until this point, all of the deaths that had fallen at the hands of Thomas could be explained away as perhaps accidents or misadventure, even though it was fairly obvious in some cases that this was more than just a few slip-ups. However, his next victim was definitely planned. When Thomas began treating a gentleman for epilepsy with his own homemade remedy, he also began treating his wife to an affair. Daniel Stott, who worked for the railway, began dropping hints that he knew about Cream and Mrs. Stott's affair, and in turn, Thomas and Mrs. Stott exacted a plan to do away with Daniel so the two of them could continue their relationship. When Daniel's next set of tablets were prescribed to him, he took them as usual, but this time something was wrong. The dosage had been tampered with, and they were filled with strychnine, a common household rat poison at the time. Strychnine, apart from killing rats, was also used to treat certain medical conditions, but had to be used incredibly sparingly to avoid death. Patients who suffered from respiratory illness, heart problems and sleep apnea, amongst other conditions, were all treated with the deadly powder. If people knew the dangers behind it, I doubt they would have agreed to take it. An overdose of the powder causes an incredibly painful end, with the onset causing an intense sense of encroaching fear, followed by muscle spasms, which intensify until the sufferer is rendered unconscious. Luckily, the use of strychnine as a household item was mainly outlawed in the 1920s, but it remained in medical use all the way up to the 1980s. In some parts of America, it's still legal to use as a pesticide, and if you're someone who lives in America and likes to partake in powdery extracurricular activities, you should be careful, as this is something which is sometimes used to cut those things with. Apologies for the vagueness, but YouTube likes to hide my videos if I'm too specific with my language on certain topics. But anyway, back to the story. Daniel died almost instantly after ingesting the contaminated medicine, but unlike Thomas's other crimes, the poisoning didn't go unnoticed. When Thomas found out about Daniel dying, he instantly set about blaming everyone else, as he had done with Mary Ann's death. After all, if the tactic had fooled everyone before, then surely it would work again. This time he pointed the finger at the pharmacist, saying he prescribed the wrong tablets and added strychnine to the dosage, which was something he hadn't asked him to do. When it came to protesting his innocence formally, he did so by writing a letter to the coroner, who investigated Cream's claims and found that the chemist had most definitely not used the poison in the prescription, and instead the tablets had been tampered with after collection. To ascertain who was telling the truth, the body of Daniel, which had only just been buried, was exhumed and tested for poisons. Inside his stomach, the signs of damage from the strychnine were there, and given the chemist's clear personal record and Thomas's peppered one, the finger was pointed in his direction. Thomas, realising his plea of innocence had now been scuppered, was yet again on the run. He packed his bags and hopped the border back into Canada but this time he wouldn't get away with it. Eventually, the authorities caught up with Thomas and he was arrested and taken back to Chicago to stand trial for the murder of Daniel Stott. In order to save herself from being implicated, Mrs. Stott said she would testify against Thomas, and as such, she was allowed to go free. After a short but intense trial, the jury heard the damning evidence brought before them, and it wasn't long before they reached a verdict. The judge passed a sentence of life imprisonment for Thomas for the murder of Daniel, and he was whisked away to live out his days in Joliet Prison. The end. Wait, 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 come back here, I'm not done with you yet. Of course that wasn't the end, or else this would be a very short episode and you'd all be very disappointed. 
So Thomas did spend some time rotting behind bars, but due to some pretty corrupt finagling by his brother, bribing and begging friends in high places for a rethink of his sentence, Thomas walked free after serving just 10 years of his life imprisonment. Now, out of prison and unsure of what to do next, Thomas got out of Chicago as quickly as possible and headed back to Canada. Seven years into Cream's sentence, his father had passed away. You'd be forgiven for thinking that, since his time inside, that Thomas may be heading to Canada to spend time with his family and to reconnect with them, but nah. Thomas made a fleeting visit to see his brother, who had worked to free him, thanking him for all his hard work, but also making sure he collected his $16,000 that had been on ice from his inheritance. With his money in his back pocket, a substantial sum which was enough to get him back on his feet, and more importantly, away from his previous murdery faux pas, the next step was to work out exactly where to head to next. After all, America didn't want him, nor did Canada, and if he stayed in either of the countries, it would only be a matter of time before he would be recognised and moved on from wherever he was. Instead of subjecting himself to a remaining life of uncertainty, at the age of 41, he crossed the pond back to London, where he could live anonymously and plan out exactly what his next move would be, which just may or may not include some more murder and you thought it was already out of control, it gets much worse. However, for that, you'll need to join me next week for part two of The Cream Poisonings. So do make sure that you're subscribed on YouTube and following the podcast in your podcast app so you don't miss out. As always, please let me know your thoughts about this case so far in the comments below on YouTube or on my social media if you're listening to the podcast. Loads of you have been in touch recently with stories and suggestions and just letting me know that you're enjoying the show, so it's really appreciated and thanks so much if you've taken the time to do that. If you'd like to help me make more of these, then please consider becoming a patron like our executive Patreon producers Sam, Barry, Sarah, Kate, Veronica and Mary and all of our other patrons too. You can help support the show from as little as just $1 a month and $5 tiers and up get access to exclusive content such as the extra podcast and YouTube show with things I find in old newspapers, which will be going up there in a few days. And there's plenty of old episodes on there as well. So sign up now if you'd like to get involved in that and you'll also get some tangible goodies sent through the post too. And if you can't do that right now, then it would mean the world to me if you spread the word and told your friends about the show. It's free and it really helps me. And also your friends will think you're really cool for telling them about a cool show, even if I do say so myself. Also, one last thing, if you're new here and you've stuck around all the way until the end, then clearly you like it here, so why not hit that subscribe button and join me? It'd be great to have you join the ghoul gang. Thanks for joining me for another macabre tale from London's past. I've been Nikki Drews, and I'll see you ghouls for part two next time.